want to welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Doctrine of Christ. We're so honored that you're taking this time to study the Word of God with us. And we want to begin in John, the 15th chapter, and we want to read the first two verses. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. And Jesus here is drawing an analogy as he often does. And he will use parables and analogies with things that we know to help us really understand the relationship between him and his father and between us and him and his father. So Jesus is the true vine. The father is the husbandman and believers in Christ are the branches. Very, very straightforward. Now in verse two, he makes the statement, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And as we get down in our text here, we're going to see the doom of the fruitless branches. And it's not a very pretty picture. So this is an important topic. Already we sense we're talking about something important here, because if fruit isn't present, it will be taken away. And every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, the purging process, and when in purging or pruning, it's just like weeding your garden. And there's something there that needs to be taken out. You know, you've got a good crop of corn coming up, but you got some weeds there. You got to get out for the rest to grow. Now, this is laid out in Scripture, understanding the bad fruit mixed with the good. It's very similar to the tares mixed with the wheat. And let's look at the context from the prophet Isaiah. And here again, the word of God, if we can just slow down and read it precept upon precept and line upon line, there's no, it it is just very clear the way the father communicates to us in Isaiah chapter five. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So here in the vineyard, which is Israel, and now we're the Israel of God, we are the branches that need to be pruned. You see, here in the prophet Isaiah, the father's the husbandman, and Israel before the cross was the vineyard. But there was a problem. It was bringing forth wild grapes. And these wild grapes uh, resulted in the judgment of God coming upon Israel. And this ties in so much to the doctrine of Christ that he will uh, unveil throughout his ministry, dealing with the wild grapes, trying to get the wild grapes out. And in Hosea chapter 10 and verse one and two, it there, the prophet says, Israel is an empty vine. It's a vine that uh, it didn't want to deal with the wild grapes. It allowed itself to assimilate uh, during the captivity with Babylonian religion. And they incorporated these wild grapes of the religions of the pagan nations into the religion of the father. And this just doesn't do. You got to have pure grapes with no wild grapes. And that's the problem. Israel kept wanting these wild grapes. And as it says in the prophet Hosea, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. Now, that's a very important phrase, and this really resonates with what Christ taught in John chapter 15. There is real fruit and good fruit. There's wild grapes, and there are people that are bringing fruit unto themselves. Now, 
it's not a criticism. It's just an observation that most ministries, and that's putting it kindly, are doing what they're doing for themselves. They are bringing forth fruit unto themselves. They are wanting fame. They are wanting uh, power. They are wanting prestige. They're wanting money. And they're bringing forth fruit unto themselves instead of bringing forth fruit unto the kingdom of God. And how we bring forth real fruit is very clearly laid out for us. Um, in in this DOC here, and it's very important. Now it talks about the taking away. Is in Isaiah, Isaiah said, "You're bringing forth wild grapes." By the time of Hosea, Hosea said, "Now you're an empty vine. <laughs> you know the vine's empty. It's not just good grapes mixed with bad. It's empty. You know Israel's an empty vine." And Jesus talks about. The, the person that won't go through the purging process, you're going to be taken away. You know, being fruitless or is not an option. You're going to be taken away. And at the national level, we can see this happening in um, Matthew chapter 21. And this is the verse, one of the many verses that make our dispensationalist friends cringe. But in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43, this is so easy, Jimmy, you and me can even understand it. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And this is the removal of Israel as a nation, you say. And because they didn't bring forth the fruits thereof. They went from wild grapes to an empty vine and they became so stubborn that they crucified the son of God when, when he came to the vineyard. So this gives us a clear identification, unmistakably so, of what wild grapes and bad fruit is. And there's another aspect of it too, that we're going to look at. There's two aspects of fruit bearing, and we see two aspects of bad fruit that we're going to have to get out. And um, let's run it back just a little bit. Let's go back to a statement that we read uh, from Matthew Henry on our last DOC, the one on the law. I think that just went up today, and we read the statement from Matthew Henry. And he is one of my favorite counselors for good common sense. And he said this, and it was commenting on Matthew five seventeen through 20, where he said he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, which was the subject of our entire DOC just last week. But he said this, uh, he said, boys, you're doing one thing good and one thing bad. He says to the scriptures of the old Testament as their rule. And therein Christ here shows them they were there. They were in the right. Number two to the scribes and the Pharisees as their example. And therein Christ here shows them they were may, they were very in the wrong. So you're using the old Testament. Well, boys, that's good. Scribe, the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, yeah, that is bad. And this puts, and you see all of these things, whether it's the tares and the wheat or whether it's the good and the bad fruit, all of this is to purify the Israel of God, to get out the tares, to get out the wild grapes, get back to the pure wine of the doctrine of Christ to whereby there is purity and no defilement. Now, the scripture in Matthew 5 that tops off that section, it's good for us to just take note of that. Because in Matthew 5, 20, and this is interesting, you see these little things in the Bible. We'll read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. Jesus said, for I say unto you, 
that accept your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. We might not be much, but we got to be better than that. And in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, we read in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, about how Israel was bringing forth wild grapes. Well, listen to what the prophet says in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And it's such a powerful chapter, and I, I could just go on. In verse 22, it says, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine. And this is just more than alcoholic wine. This is drinking the wine that is made from the bad grapes. And there are a lot of people out there today that are saying the bad grapes that Jesus wanted his disciples to get rid of, they're saying, oh, no, that's good grapes. That's good wine. We need to have some of that wine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in the in the book of Revelation, and uh, I was teaching in this vein just recently on FOJC, that the reason why people cannot discern the simple truths that the Bible says is that they are drunk. You can't reason with a drunk. And in Revelation 17, it speaks of the harlot being drunk with the wine of the fornication and that she's made the whole world drunk, you see. And people are intoxicated with their 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 bad grapes to where they can't hear the pure word of God and that pure wine that will really be a blessing to them. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 6, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus gets very specific here in Matthew chapter 16. I love it when he does that. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's nothing here that's left to our imagination. Very clear, very straightforward. People just don't like it. People today are enamored with bad grapes and bad wine. They've drunk rot. You know, it's just like an alcoholic. They'll drink that rat, rot, gut, mad dog, 50, 50. And (laughs) they don't, they'd rather have a little mad dog, 50, 50 than the finest wine, you know, (laughs) because they're drunk. They're drunk. They don't care. They're just an old alky. And they're people that are spiritual alcoholics and you can't, you can't reason well. Yeah. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And in verse 11 and 12, there's nothing left here to wonder about. It says, how is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread? that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees is leaven. And every Jewish boy and girl knew the wonderful story of the Passover how that leaven, which represented sin, it was to be totally put out of the home. It wasn't to be messed with, to cut down. Well, cut down on our leaven. No, the leaven goes. It's put out. And the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it's just this. It's bad grapes. It's leaven. It has to be totally put out. Now, this is what so many people don't want to do. They are in love with personalities and teachers in the uh, Messianic and Hebrew root movement that serve up bad grapes regularly. There are so many examples that time wouldn't even allow for all of them. Well, that's through the whole 
church of Christianity as well. I mean, there's personalities and there's a there's a bunch of big ones going on right now out there. Oh gosh, yes. So and uh and the leaven the the leaven from the Hebrew root dispensational or the Hebrew root messianic movement has married and kissed with dispensationalism. And this is the conduit that feeds back and forth. So well, people, and what's that what's that one scripture say? A little leaven? And yeah. Over time, yeah. leaven's the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And let's read that. Let's read that scripture um, in Galatians chapter five and verse nine. And the idea today is a little leaven doesn't hurt a thing. And people think that, you know, we'll just uh, have a little of this and a little of that. And two of the most popular Messianic Bibles, the complete Jewish Bible and the one new man Bible, they both have in it the Kabbalistic interpretation that come from Itzhak Luria, the father of modern Kabbalah, of the four levels of interpretation. That is just pure Kabbalah. And the and all of these people, they will bless their hearts. They think they're doing good and uh, they'll want to say, now, my goodness, we're going to over at our assembly. We give the ironic blessing and we hold our hands like this rabbi. You know, we'll we'll do this. Oh, no. Now we do it this way, like this rabbi, you know, like I mean, it, it's darkness, not light. And they're calling good evil and evil good. This is just wild grapes. You know, and people need to get rid of the wild grapes, get back to the pure word of God and the doctrine of Christ. And then we'll understand, just like we did uh, the DOC that I think is uploading today on the law, the real understanding of the law. And we'll get it. Yeah, it's right. Uh, we do obey the law, but we're, go- we're not going to do it with wild grapes. We're going to do it with the pure wine mm. and uh, everything will work out real good. Now, let's get to that text you mentioned, Jimmy. And these things are, are, are very, very true, even though people don't like to think they are. And leaven is, I don't think people even try to worry about spiritual leaven, most people. But in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's our memory verse for today. Uh, yeah. Galatians 5, 9, a little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. So and it's just short enough for me to memorize. I can get that one. <laughs> yeah, I can get that one. So it's, it's real easy here. The doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you don't assimilate it. You take it away. And this is the biggest hindrance, you see. And what happens if you don't take away this leaven instead of bearing fruit Under the kingdom of God, you bear fruit unto yourself, or you bear fruit unto some man that is building something other than the kingdom of God. It's either Jesus Christ or it's something else. You're either with me or against me. Now, let's go back to our text. In John chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. And Jesus really brings it out here. And you see, this is so. Uh, over and over, like the DOC we did about the law, Christ come to show us the true meaning of the law. And here he's referencing these passages. And when we understand Isaiah 5 and Hosea 10, this just really clicks and the lights come on. Now, in John chapter 15, let's look at verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Look over at your neighbor and say, he's talking about the doctrine of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Yeah, he's talking about the doctrine of Christ. You're clean through the word that I spoke on you. You see, that's the real pure wine, the doctrine of Christ. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. Now, that means to be in relationship with Christ through faith. And we've laid some foundation there in our DOCs on true repentance, what repentance is, understanding 
uh, and also in Christian perfection, we, we dealt with this. This is just how we maintain our relationship. We abide in Christ. We mess up. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us our sin, to for, forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You see, real fruit comes from abiding in Christ. Now, apart from abiding in Christ and that relationship in him, the branch can't bring forth any real fruit. Now, the branches can think they're doing something. Now, there's been a lot of times when I thought, hey, I'm, I'm really doing something here. But I was just bringing forth fruit unto myself. I wasn't really focused on the doctrine of Christ and what he really wanted. We're clean through the word he spoke unto us, and we are defiled by the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now, that was a song title, wasn't it, Jimmy? Yep, yep. I remember that Petra song. That was a Petra yeah. song. For without me you can do nothing. And that that's a good little thing for us to have in our mind. Now, well, I heard this, I heard this analogy, uh, today when I was doing some research, I wrote it down here. It says, um, and it was talking about the vine and how it comes from the ground and the vine, the, the, the vine gathers all the nutrients and it pushes out the sap to the branches. The branches aren't up there pulling the sap out of the vine. The vine, that's that's why they why Jesus is saying, abide in me and my words abide in you. And then it's like like the branches and and I think I, I made a reference to it maybe in a, an episode or two ago about um you know oranges. An orange tree makes oranges. It it doesn't it just does it. It's natural because yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. And it doesn't have to try to, you know, so it's like if you abide in me, then you'll bear much fruit. But if you don't abide in me, you can do nothing. Yeah. So it's all and it's all about abiding and then letting him do that work. Right. Am I understanding that right? That is something that we cannot emphasize enough. And all of us branches need to understand we can't bring forth fruit in the flesh. You cannot manufacture the fruits of the spirit. And there are a lot of people, this is called putting on your church face. You know, when people go to church, they'll put on their imitation fruits of the spirit. And, uh, but the real fruit of the spirit only comes from that relationship and the branch. I mean, we can't say this enough because we all get there to where we, we get into the flesh and we even try to manufacture the fruits of the spirit and it cannot be done. It, we can't say it enough. And also, and of course we have to really do things. We have to actually do this tonight or it wouldn't get done, but real fruit for the kingdom of God only flows out of that relationship. Well, yeah, I, I think our only effort is abiding in him. We yeah. do have to put that work into it, right? Yeah. We have to stay. I'm not, Yeah. I mean, I'm not always abiding in him if I'm, I know I, I, re, I saw something earlier that would argue with what I just said, but because it said once you're, uh, uh, well, I wrote it down too. I, I wanted to see what you thought about this. It said, for you not to abide in the vine is, is for Jesus to stop abiding in his relationship with the Father, because that will never happen. There is no danger for you not abiding. And it just struck me a little weird because I feel like 
in, in, when I look back at my past life and, and, uh, I would have so many ups and downs in my relationship with God. And, you know, I can tell a difference in the results I was getting in my life, or even if it was just in how I was feeling or how I was dealing with stuff or the level of stress that I allowed in my life or just worry and panic. And, you know, I wasn't abiding and, and I wasn't bearing fruit as a result of it. Yeah. Now so, let's analyze that statement, Jimmy, that, uh, that there's no danger, nothing to worry about, about not abiding. Is that a little leaven? <laughs> well, let's, let's just put that statement aside. What Jesus said, if a man in John fifteen six, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and he is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now that sounds like that could be a problem. That sounds like, yeah, that's, that's, that's why when I heard this guy say that, I'm like, man, and that's the, that's the little leaven that's out there. And it's, it, it's leavening a whole lump. If people just let it and they don't, they don't read, they don't read their Bible for themselves. And when we can train ourselves by a, lifelong study of the doctrine of Christ, when we hear statements like that, the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance what Jesus said. And we obviously, we immediately know this individual is real wrong. And the things that are taught in the American religious establishment, most of it is in direct contradiction to the plain doctrine of the pure wine of Christ. There is so much leaven that the whole lump is really, 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 really getting rotten. Now, a scripture that comes to mind is 1 Timothy uh, 6 and 12. Uh, You see, and we do have to fight, but here's our fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, wherein too thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We fight the fight of faith. We have to fight to keep ourselves focused on the C, the D, the E, the cross, the doctrine, and the example of Christ. Because just like that statement you brought forth from that individual, some of the biggest name, the, not some, the, biggest name preachers and most popular in Christianity routinely are teaching things that directly contradict the one that they're claiming to serve. And that's just one of many examples. So fighting the fight of faith is the fight we fight. And when we get out of focus, we go back to first John one nine and we get in focus and a great scripture that is very much in line with our thought. And this is the, uh, well, I'll read the text in Romans 8 and 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And if we fight that fight and we keep our faith on the cross, that finished work, and we keep our faith in Jesus Christ, throne-centered. We're cross-centered, we're throne-centered. Set your affections on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Like John Bunyan said, we got to remember that we have an advocate, an intercessor, and a great high priest. We're cross-centered, we're throne-centered, we're, we're doctrine of Christ-centered. And then, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law, sin, and death. When our faith is right, the Holy Spirit will be released to us. It's our faith in the cross that releases the Holy Spirit. When when it was only because of Calvary that we had Pentecost. So without faith in the cross, that flow of the Holy Spirit doesn't come to us. It's the fight of faith. And then that anointing of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin, to have revelation, to bring to our mind what he said, it all works and it works naturally and it works through abiding in him and Christ abiding in us. All right. 
Let's go back to John chapter 15 and let's look at verse 16 and let's think about two aspects of fruit. And there's two aspects to it. And we'll think about this. There's two aspects to good fruit. There's two aspects to bad fruit. Uh, John chapter 15 and verse 16. Ye, and we did a DOC on this also. Uh, but I don't think we're going to have to worry about wearing it out. Um, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. You see, that's our mission, to go bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, this aspect of fruit is fruit that is born in our obedience to the Great Commission, which we also took a uh, one of our earliest DOCs. This is foundational, the Great Commission. And I just want to read that to make sure everyone understands what the Great Commission is. And the fruit of John 15, 16, this is fruit that we bear uh, in obedience to the Great Commission. The reason why we're doing the DOC tonight is because of the Great Commission. In uh, Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we're doing this tonight, Jimmy, in obedience to the Great Commission. He said, teach people all things I commanded you. That's what we're doing. And when we do this, other people will believe the doctrine of Christ for salvation. Uh, they will pray to Jehovah Rapha for healing and for many things, you see. And that fruit, if it's truly based on the doctrine of Christ, it will remain, you see. Now, there's that aspect of fruit bearing, and it's very important. There are a lot of people uh, that are bringing forth fruit unto themselves. It's so obvious in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul taught about the foundation. He said, no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, Jesus Christ. So you see, it's either the doctrine of Christ, the cross, the doctrine or example, or it's some other foundation. It's going to be full of weeds, wild grapes. Uh, it's going to be a mess. It's not going to be pure. So all we got to do is just come back to that pure wine, abide in him, and then our fruitfulness begins. But if you want to bear fruit, and this is a question we get a lot, how do I bear fruit? You have to begin with a serious self-examination whereby you're willing to throw the bad grapes out. It's just like an alcoholic. You know, if an alcoholic wants to sober up, you got to go through the cupboard. You got to get that whiskey jug. You got tucked back up there. You got to take it. You got to throw it out. And this is the same way. If you want to bear fruit, you have to begin throwing out them wild grapes. Well, I and, think uh, I think it's also like that same kind of analogy. Uh, I've heard, I've got friends and I've had friends in the past that, smoke or drink too much, you know, and, or eat too much. And I'll always, I started, I started learning patterns of, of their speech. If they would say, I have to quit smoking, they would try and it wouldn't take very long and, and they're back doing it again. But when, when success started happening for my friends, it was when they started saying, I want to quit. It, it went from I have to quit, I should quit. See, they they weren't ready to give up on it. They didn't. They they were just thinking that's that was the right thing to do. But it wasn't until they said I want to is when stuff started changing. So I think there's a lot of Christians, and I would count myself in this group that for the majority of my life. I was just like, I got to, man, I need to, 
be better. I need to read my Bible more. I need to pray more. I need to do all this or that. And I would do it for a little while. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take, and it wouldn't take very long. And I'm back to my old ways and attitudes and, and all this. And it wasn't until I got just sick and tired of the pig pen I was living in to where I said, I want this the right way. Yeah. And that's when things turned around. So, and it, and when we do it through relationship, it just happens. Yeah. You see, when we try to do anything, whether it's quit smoking, quit drinking, quit anything, or even starting stuff, yeah, uh, you can't do it in the flesh. You can do it for a day or two, but for it to really remain, it's got to flow out of that relationship. Yeah. And we are all such weak creatures and we're so easily misled and we've got to tap in uh, and I'll use that AA phrase to that higher power, not as in AA, any higher power, but the higher power than our flesh, which is the cross. Right. And when we tap into that, the Holy spirit will flow into our life and it will just happen. And, uh, we, we just cannot do it on our own willpower. Um, I never I'm, have been able to. <laughs> no, nobody can. And the apostle Paul could. Now let's look at that in Romans seven eighteen. Now this shows you, now you got to come to the place where you want to, like you say, but even when you come to the place where you want to, the mistake a lot of people make is that us little branches, we think we can do it ourselves, and you can't. And, Willpower is not enough, uh, and that might uh, and a lot of Christians believe that if they just have enough willpower, they can do anything. Well, you can't. Uh, Paul couldn't. In Romans seven eighteen, he said, "For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing." Now this is just like Jesus said that branch on its own it can't do anything. Right in flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. You see, the apostle Paul came to the place where he says, I want to, I want to, but it still wasn't enough. Willpower's not enough. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So we got to go beyond Romans 7, 18 to Romans 8 and 2. For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin of death. The only thing that'll set us free from the law of sin and death is faith in the cross that releases the Holy Spirit unto us. And that is abiding. Abide in me and I in you. Then you're on to your way to some fruit. Now let's look at another aspect of fruit. Bearing fruit is obedience to the Great Commission. And bearing fruit is also the fruit of the spirit that comes out of us through our relationship with Christ. Now, there's two aspects of bad fruit. You let you can let our carnal nature bring forth attitudes that Paul calls the works of the flesh. And there's building on polluted foundations. Well, I'm going to do something for God and you wind up. Uh, helping some dingbat that's in crazy land, you know? So that's just fruit into yourself or fruit under some guy, like trying to help Jesse Duplantis buy another airplane. You know, that's not fruit and for God, that's fruit for that goofy little critter. I, I thought I was doing the right thing, David. I've repented for that many times. No, I didn't send money to Jesse Duplantis. I'm kidding. Good. Well, I'm glad. Well, you know, there, <laughs> I had you going there for a minute. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's times that uh, people uh, are caught up in that word of faith movement. Yeah. And uh, the craziness of so many we could name Jesse Duplantis and uh, or old Copenhagen and uh, this guy. Um, Oh, I can't think of the name. I always says money cometh money cometh. And I mean, it's insanity. It's, it's, 
so totally contradictory to the doctrine of Christ. I just but, never heard Jesus saying that. I yeah. mean, I never heard Jesus saying that. No, no. Money's coming. Money coming. And, uh, and of course, we could just say a lot about that, but it, it's, it's obvious, to I believe, to, to most of our listeners. Now, let's look at uh, a text from 1 Corinthians 5. Let's just read verse 7 and 8. And this is very appropriate in the understanding of the feast. Um, in verse 7, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. You see, it doesn't say don't keep the feast anymore. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. That's why when we honor the Passover, we will not do a Jewish Seder. I have attended Jewish Seders in my life. I have attended my last one because the Jewish Seder, and we got a, a teaching on FOJC called uh, the Sederless Passover, where I go into all the history of when the Jewish Seder came in. All of this came in after, uh, after Jesus. Uh, it's not anything he did. So we keep the feast. We honor all of God's appointed times, but we don't do it with old leaven. We don't bring in the, the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees to pollute those times because they're special. Now, he goes on here to tell us something we need to hear. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Now, here we have another kind of leaven. It's not just the leaven of the doctrine of the scribes, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but it's now talking about things that come out of our carnal nature, malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So now we've got two kinds, don't we? We can bear bad fruit by building on a polluted foundation. We can bear bad fruit from trying to serve God from selfish motives. And you can bear bad fruit from allowing the works of the flesh manifest through your life. And the two types of good fruit are bringing forth the pure doctrine of Christ, the pure gospel, that people will be drawn to the Lamb of God that we're lifting up, and the true fruit of the fruit of the Spirit that comes out of our life through abiding in Him. And once we get the fruit of the Spirit, and once we get that pure wine flowing into our, our, our blood vessels, the fruit will just happen. Direction, guiding, and unction of the Holy Spirit. It'll happen naturally. And you don't have to force things and uh, try to be a little branch that... Uh, you know, there's the little engine that could. Well, I was thinking the, about that earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the little branch that could, it gets in a mess sometimes because um, we get our fleshly efforts in the way of the flow of the wine through abiding, you say. And we have to use effort. We, we do. But once we get the, the wine flowing, then when the wine gives us direction, then we go with it, you see. And that nuance is very important for us to understand. Yeah, it just feels like to me the effort is the repentant lifestyle. The That's it. Yeah. you know, we talked about that. If if that that does we do do that. That is on our part. We 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 have to make ourselves do that and maybe in the beginning and then it just becomes such a refreshment uh like you just, I have to, I can't, I, I need to repent. And you don't even put it off anymore. And, you know, um, a good example of this is something we, we, a cliche we hear over and over. And a lot of preachers say this at the end of their message. I know radio preachers at the end of their message, they'll say, go out and find the church in your area. That's right for you. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. And <laughs> that's the big mistake right there. And there, and you know, we all want fellowship, don't we? I mean, sure. I love, uh, when we can get together, not just over the Skyper, you know, and it's something good about that. And we all long for that. We long for, um, I know I, we got a friend of ours. She says every once in a while, I need some God with skin on it. You know, <laughs> got to have some real people. We all need that. Yeah. But we can't allow that to push us in to a polluted vineyard. And right. that's what people will do. They'll say, well, um, there's three churches within five miles of me. I know I got to be at one of them. I'm going to pick one and go there. And a lot of times that drives us into situations that um, are very bad and very hurtful. Yeah. So let's go to Galatians chapter five and let's think about this other aspect of fruit. And in Galatians five, the apostle Paul talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. And it's the fruit of the spirit. And the fruit of the spirit is the fruit of the spirit. Like we said, Romans eight and two, that the Holy spirit, when we keep our faith in the cross, it releases to us by abiding. The fruit is natural. It's so good. And, uh, in Galatians five twenty two, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. Now let's look at these words and I'm going to ask brother Adam Clark to help us with this a little bit. And I'm going to read his definitions of each of these are real good. So I'm just going to read his definitions here and, uh, they're good. Let's just look at the first one. Love. An intense desire to please God and to do good to mankind, the very soul and spirit of all true religion, the fulfilling of the law and what gives energy to faith itself. Now, we talked about that quite a bit in our doctrine of Christian perfection, love fulfilling the law, love being our rule on how we serve God and man. Mm -hmm. Now that's the first fruit of the spirit an intense desire to please God. It's intense, Jimmy, when you are abide in the vine, that wine that flows into your spiritual veins will give you an intense desire to please God. And a lot of people that say they're believers, they obviously do not have an intense desire to please God. It's pretty obvious. And something also that's obvious here in the King James Bible, which I dearly love, it translates agape here as love. Now, this same word in 1 Corinthians 13 is translated charity. Now, an old preacher by the name of Dean Bergon, when uh, Westcott and Hort in the 19th century, they were producing their apostate text, they emphasized that the word agape should be translated love in 1 Corinthians 13. And a wise old fellow by the name of Dean Bergon, he said, uh, and he said it much better than I will, but he said, you mark my words there will be much devilment come from changing the word charity to the word love. Agape means the unmerited favor of God toward us. Charity is the perfect word for that. We know if we get charity, we don't deserve it. Right. That's the perfect word. Now, love, that has a lot of meanings. And changing charity to love has so polluted that understanding that the rest is history, so to speak. Mm. But in this context, the King James translates it love because it's not talking about God's unmerited 
favor by which we're saved, but that intense love that comes from the Holy Spirit after we are a believer, this love comes from the the vine, you see, into us branches, and it gives us an intense desire to please God and to do right by God and man. And this love is the very first fruit of the Spirit. And if we don't get this one, we're not going to get the other eight, you see. And this is right where we were at in this understanding on Christian perfection in that DOC, understanding that love fulfills the law, that if, if you, we just get to a really hooked up here and abide in him and let Christ abide in us, this is going to happen, you see. He goes on to say joy. The exultation that arises from a sense of God's mercy communicated to the soul in the pardon of its iniquities and the prospect of that eternal joy of which it has a foretaste in the pardon of sin. And this joy that's a fruit of the spirit, it's not joy of getting a new bicycle, but it's joy that comes from understanding. Yeah, we're born again. Our sins are forgiven. And when we live, leave this earthly body will be with Christ forever. That's something to really be joyful about. Amen. You see, happiness is something you get from um, getting a new car will make you happy. And nothing wrong with that. But joy is something different. Joy um, doesn't ha many times we allow Satan to steal our joy through outward circumstances. But joy is that deep rooted joy that comes from knowing that we're abiding in the vine and that our soul is secure in him. Which that just leads into the next one. Because of that, then peace comes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it begins with love and it flows. You see, these are, are these in order for a reason? Yeah. Oh yeah. It sure seems and like it, doesn't it? Beatitudes. When we get over to the Beatitudes, it's, it's, uh, it's right there. It's, uh, it's they flow yeah. and you see, you got to get square one, right? You get the love, right? Well, you're going to have the joy, right? And then you're going to have the peace, right? Uh, and love fulfills the law. And we could say love also fulfills all of the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. And they absolutely are in order and it, it flows. It's first thing first abide in me and I in you. Then here comes the love. Then here comes the joy. Then here comes the peace, the calm, quiet, and order which take place in the justified soul instead of the doubts, fears, alarms, and dreadful forebodings which every true penitent less or more feels and must feel till the assurance of pardon brings peace and satisfaction to the mind. Now, this is very much in the neighborhood of perfect love casts out all fear. And you see, it's more uh, Isaiah 26 and 3 says, For thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Uh, Romans 5 and 2, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace is in the relationship. But if we do not allow it, and scripture talks about quenching the Holy Ghost, we have to allow it to flow. And always Satan is going to want to take the cares of this world to defile us and to prevent that flow. But we have to allow, uh, and a scripture Donna quotes to me a lot, is let the peace of God rule in your heart. You know, we have to let it, you know, we have to allow the peace of God to flow and not to allow the things of our everyday life and all of our worries to bog us down. And when we get bogged down, what do we do? We go back to first John nine, we hook up and we let that perfect love take us into the peace of God to where we know 
it is well with my soul, as the old hymn says. That's great. Long suffering. Now, here's one for us all to work on. Um, and how do we work on it? We just let it flow. If we are short on long suffering, we just pray. Father, just let the, the Holy Spirit fill my life to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, because it's a fruit from him. It's not from us, obviously. Long-suffering, long-mindedness, bearing with the frailties and the provocations of others. Do you know how you can tell if you got enough long-suffering or not? When someone comes up behind you in traffic and starts honking the horn and yelling at you, or if you're in the line there uh, at the drive through and it's always something to do with traffic and driving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it seems to be, doesn't it? But there are plenty of things that will give us the long suffering test, right? Bearing with the frailties and provocations of others from the consideration that God has borne long with ours. You see, have we ever done any of that stuff? Have we ever provoked God or uh, not been quite we, what we ought to be? Well, we should consider that in allowing the Holy Spirit to bring forth a little long suffering in us for some other folks, you know, and that if he had not, we should have been spared speedily consumed, bearing up also through all the troubles and difficulties of life without murmuring or repining, submitting cheerfully to every dispensation of God's providence and thus deriving benefit from every occurrence. Yes, we can even have benefit when others will provoke us because this will Drive us to our knees to allow the Holy Spirit to bring forth more long suffering. Now, what if you don't do that? What if you just let that bad fruit rise up? Now, that might not be a very good thing because Jesus in John 15, he had some things to say about that, didn't he? Yeah. I'm going to purge you. You see, I'm going to purge you. And if we need more long suffering, what will bring that purging in our life, throwing us in a situation where we have to get that flow of the Holy Spirit to overcome it, you see. And this helps us to understand that even these unpleasantness that we experience, that we reap benefit from them, like Brother Clark said. Would that, would that be considered pruning? That's pruning. Yeah, it is. And, you know, sometimes, Jimmy, them old pruning shears bite a bit, you know. Uh, they're not rubber pruning shears, you know. They'll snip that right off. Yeah. And, ooh, you know, it kind of hurts sometimes to go out to the <laughs> woodshed. But that's where he does his pruning. It's out to the woodshed. Yep. And I said one other time, the next time you're at the woodshed, look there and you'll see my initials carved. <laughs> and, uh, that's where we learn our best lessons is out in the woodshed. But that's the pruning process. Yep. And we have to welcome it. We have to understand that this is the common experience of all believers. We learn from it and we benefit from it. We grow. That's how we and grow. We our fruit to go. Yeah. Got to cut the bad stuff off. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, here's another one. Gentleness. A very rare grace, often wanting in many who have a considerable share of Christian excellence, a good education and polished manners when brought under the influence of the graces of God will bring out this grace with great effect. And I think a lot of times us men, we have trouble being gentle to be, uh, and people will confuse being effeminate with gentleness. A good father must be gentle and men have, and you know, it's not something that we own. Women can do this too, but by the way we are wired, we can, 
become harsh and domineering. So gentleness is a fruit of the spirit for men and for women. We, we need to be gentle. And, the, and there's times, you know, when we have to, uh, we have to be strong, just like Moses. And um, in another one of the fruit of the spirit here is meekness. And I'm just going to save that for when we get to it. So I'm just going to put that on the shelf for just a moment. Now, the next one is goodness. The perpetual desire and sincere study, not only to abstain from every appearance of evil, but to do good to the bodies and souls of men to the utmost of our ability. We should want to do good to people, you see. And if we get the love flowing, that love will help us to have an intense desire to love God and man. And toward men, this being good to people, you know, I mean, a lot of people just aren't nice. (laughs) You know, we need to be good, do nice things for people. And this is a fruit of the spirit that manifests out of that original impulse of love. Faith, here used for fidelity, punctuality in performing promises. Now, have you ever had a believer say, I'm going to do this or that, and they don't do it? And I think this is one thing that is so lacking. And faith here, it means more along the line of faithfulness. In other words, we believe and we're born again, but this fruit of the Spirit, it causes us to be faithful in our commitments to God and faithful in our commitments to other people. Now, I know a lot of times, sometimes I'll say I'm going to do something and I can play the age card. I just don't remember, you know, so sometimes I have to be reminded. But we got to be faithful to God and faithful to men in our commitments. And certainly this comes in in the marriage relationship or in all relationships within the body of Christ and with the father. So and this is a fruit of the spirit. This is a fruit of the spirit. Uh, A lot of um, believers are like that old Irish saying uh, of the guy that uh, he was a railroad conductor and he was Irish and there was a train uh, derailment and it got put back on the track. He said on again, off again, gone again, Flanagan. And uh, that's the way we are. We're on again, off again. And in our relationships, we got to be faithful. And this is a fruit of the spirit. When we give our word about something, uh, we should be men of faithfulness and integrity, men and women. Um, Meekness. This means mildness, indulgence toward the weak and erring, patient suffering of injuries without feeling a spirit of revenge an even balance of all tempers and passions, the entire opposite to anger. And Moses was the meekest person on earth, the scripture tells us. But when they made the golden calf, he ground the calf to powder and made him drink it. <laughs> Now, weakness, meekness is not weakness, right? But meekness knows and a meekness knows that I'm a little branch and without him, I can't do anything. Whatever good I ever do from the kingdom of God, when I pray, a lot of times I say, uh, and we're going to give you the praise for everything good that happens because everything good that happens is because of him. Yeah. And we're just being obedient. And uh, he's got to bring the the fruit that remains. um, That's got to come from the Father. Temperance. Continence, self-government, or moderation. 
principally with regard to sensual or animal appetites. And the very next verse in verse 24, it says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And the only way we have to die to self, we have to be dead to sin and alive to Christ, as Paul said in Romans 6. And only when we have crucified the flesh and united by faith to the divine, then we see that real fruit come forth. Okay, we're going to conclude with this. In John chapter 15, verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Let's look at Brother Matthew Henry's comment on this. It's very good. He calls it the doom of the unfruitful. It is here intimated that there are many who pass for branches in Christ who yet do not bear fruit. Were they really united to Christ by faith, they would bear fruit. But being only tied to him by the thread of an outward profession, though they seem to be branches, they will soon be seen to be dry ones. And here again, we see this overlap between the fruitful, the unfruitful, the tares and the wheat. And it's this straightforward. If you're a branch and you're hooked into the vine, there's going to be fruit. There'll be fruit in your life and there will be fruit in response to your obedience to the Great Commission. And if that fruit isn't there, you are in a lot of trouble. So let's get hooked up. Let's get united with the vine. If you're not born again, repent and believe the gospel. Believe that Christ died for you and that his death on the cross was the payment for your sin debt. Repent and believe in the sacrifice of Christ for your sin debt and new birth will be yours you'll be born again, and then you'll be united with that flow of the Holy Spirit coming into your life. 